Father, I thank you that you are in the room. You've never left the room. And Lord, I just pray that as I share and as we listen to your word, God, I pray that our hearts are awakened again to the reality of what is your presence amongst us. Lord, we open up our hearts to receive the words of eternal life in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Isaiah 43, 19 says this, Behold, I am doing a new thing. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. And I read this scripture and I knew I was to share it today because I do believe God is doing a new thing. And it's an interesting bit of scripture. I'm doing a new thing. Do you not perceive it? And then God gives us the clue to how we should perceive it. It is like a way in the wilderness and streams in the desert. This is so profound. Why? Because what he's saying is, I'm not doing it where I did it before, how I did it before. If I did, it would have said this, behold, do you not perceive it? The vineyard will keep growing and the garden will keep flourishing. Right, what you have will increase. Where you've met me before, you'll meet me again. No. He's saying, in the desolate places, that's where it happens this time, where it's never happened before. That's where it begins today. I am doing a new thing. Do you not perceive it? I am beckoning, to, beckoning you to where you haven't been before, where it's dry, where it's empty. You know, the definition of desolate is bleak and fruitless, a barren land, like a way in the wilderness like rivers in the desert. This is so powerful. And I, I just start digging into this, and the Lord highlighted a scripture to me that we know really well. You would have heard it in Sunday school growing up. You call it Sunday school like when you're a kid? And you, yeah, yeah, Sunday school, all right? And you learn all the, the kind of key passages. This is a story that you've known for a long time. And uh, I just pray that as I read this scripture, you read it with, uh, with just an open mind, a beginner's mind, says in Matthew 18, if you do not become like a child, you will not inherit the kingdom. The reason I think Jesus says that is because children are always down for learning it all over again, right? Learning more, hearing it afresh, right? And so as I read this, I'm reading it for myself saying, all right, I'm going to lay down my entitlement. I'm going to lay down the idea that I know everything there is to know about this and hear it afresh, right? So if you want to open up your Bibles to Matthew 14, I'm going to read from verse 13 all the way through to verse 23. All right, let's get this going. Matthew 14. Now, when Jesus heard this, he withdrew there in a boat to a desolate place by himself. Everybody in the building say desolate. desolate. To a desolate place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion upon them. What do you say, compassion? Compassion. And he healed their sick. And now when it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, Jesus, this is a desolate place. Everybody say desolate. desolate. And the day is now over. So send the crowds away to go into the village to buy food for themselves. But Jesus said, they need not go away. Give them something to eat. And they said to him, but we only have five loaves here and two fish. And Jesus said, bring them to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass and taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing. And then he broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples and the disciples gave them to the crowds and all ate and were satisfied. Could you say satisfied? And then he took up 12 baskets full of broken pieces left over. And those who ate were about 5,000 men besides women and children, about 15,000. Immediately, he made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. The context of this scripture is very important. Jesus has just found out that John the Baptist has been brutally murdered. The disciples have come to him to report that Herod has ordered the execution of John the Baptist in a very flippant moment of entertainment. Bring me John the Baptist's head on a plate, right? Remember how, who John the Baptist is, right? John the Baptist and Jesus met each other when they were in the wombs of their mothers. They grew up together. John the Baptist baptized Jesus and initiated him into ministry. If he was English, he'd be like, John the Baptist is my best mate. That's my boy. 
Right, he knows me, he, com- he commissioned me. He's just found out not only is John the Baptist dead, but he's been decapitated. And his disciples, it says, went and got the body and buried him. That's what, that's what the context is. So Jesus hears the news and it says this, and so he withdrew to a lonely place. He went to a desolate place. Why? Because he knew he had to meet God there for himself. He knew he had to find God in emptiness and in bleakness. This is my charge this morning. If we want to be aware of the new thing that God is doing, and I am not talking about a fad or a trend, I'm talking about revival of the soul. Is anybody in the house hungry for revival of the soul? Right? We want to end this race of life hungrier than we are right now. Paul says, I fought a good fight. I finished the race and I kept the faith. I want to be a man like that. And I'm, I'm convinced that this scripture reveals to us that to be there and to run like that, we must find God in the desolate places. We must find him in the wilderness and see the ways he's creating and the rivers that are forming in the desert. And I think the biggest distraction to doing that is in a place like Jesus was when everything seems to be crumbling around us. More Lord. And, and, and there's confusion and there's destruction and there's a, there's, a, there's a sense of I don't know what to do next. Jesus hears this news of, his, of death and he goes to the desolate place. He goes to the desolate place, the place known as fruitless place, as, as bleakness, where there's nothing. Why does he go there? Because he has to meet God somewhere where nothing else and no one else could take the credit for what would happen. Right? He needs to meet the Father in a place where it's only him and the Father, so he knows that what he's getting could only be of the Father. The problem is this. The crowd hear about where he's going, and they get there first. And if Jesus was an introvert, that is the worst nightmare. Right? I'm trying to get somewhere where it's just between me and God, but everyone hears about it, and they get there. So he gets there. The crowd are already there. And what does it say? It says, Jesus saw them, and he had compassion upon them. I believe that we can only have true godly father heart compassion for other people when we put ourselves in the way of the father's compassion for us. And that's exactly what Jesus did. He was on the way to the desolate place because he was grieving. He had to meet with God. There were, oof, guess me, there was no one else who could comfort Jesus like his Abba, like his father. And so he knew, I'm going to meet my father in the desolate place. So when the crowd got there before him, he wasn't annoyed with them. He was actually filled with compassion for himself. So he had compassion to give, right? So he starts healing the sick. He starts healing the sick, and it's amazing. And he sees fruitfulness all happen in this place of, of where it's desolate. And I'm looking at this, and I'm thinking, man... Jesus was hungry, right? Jesus was hungry to be with the Father. In the time that I most often, let me hear me out here, I most often snack in this kind of context. If I'm in pain, that's when I begin to snack, not when I begin to increase hunger. When you feel in pain, it's easy to find places for immediate comfort. Right? Jesus says this in Matthew 5, 6. He says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. They will be satisfied. What he doesn't say is, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, their hunger and thirst will be satisfied. I think what he's saying is, by the fact you're hungry and thirsty, you're satisfied. It's better to be hungry than to be satisfied on things that aren't of God. It's better to end your life hungry for God than satisfied in the things of the earth, right? So we leave this earth hungry, and we reach glory, and what happens? God has prepared a feast. Right? We have a hunger that's meant to linger in our souls for the entirety of being humans on this broken earth because we have a hunger that can only be quenched by an eternal feast. Is that making sense? Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. Jesus took himself to a place of where it was desolate and where it was empty to meet with God. I grew up in a missionary family. I grew up in Pakistan, in the Himalayas. I grew up in a, in a place very, very different to where I live now. I came back in 1998, it was the World Cup. Any football fans, soccer fans in the house? Oh guys, what is going on this afternoon, this evening for me, it just doesn't even matter, right? I don't know why you're throwing a ball around, you gotta kick it. Um, but 1998, does anybody remember the World Cup in 1998? Okay, so the World Cup in 98 was huge because England got through at the quarterfinals and uh, we always get to the quarterfinals and we get knocked down. What happened in the quarterfinals is David Beckham, you know David Beckham? Yeah. David Beckham kicked an Argentinian player and he got sent off. And 
the whole nation was convinced that's why we got knocked out. It wasn't. We're just not a very good football team. And we can't handle that because we invented the game, right? Anyway, I come back to England in 1998, and I'm in the playground, and I remember saying, who's David Beckham? And these kids look at me like I'm an alien from outer space. Because I grew up in the mission field. I grew up in, in these kind of barren villages in the northern um, hemisphere of, of Pakistan in the Himalayas where my parents were just loving the uh, Muslim community. And it, Anyway, I always dreamt that I would grow up to be a missionary. I didn't. I grew up to become a millennial, right? <laughs> I, I, grew up, I grew up in the age of, of Twitter and Instagram and social media. And, uh, you know, missionary looks a little different in these times for me, but... I'm more aware now than ever that there are so many distractions coming at me trying to fill my appetite, man. I read this the other day. Every single minute, there are 200,000, every minute, 200,000 statuses updated, 136,000 photos uploaded, and 500,000 comments posted every single minute, right? We got so much informa information, information overload, so our appetite for the things that are eternal are getting quenched by the things that last like 60 seconds, right? Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. They will be satisfied. We are meant to eat, feast on something that doesn't satisfy an eternal hunger. We're meant to eat on something that increases the hunger, right? Jesus says in John 10, I've come to give you life and life in abundance. That doesn't mean I'm bringing you life that you'll feel like you've got too much, to, you've got too much of it, right? I'm giving you so much life that you'll constantly feel you've got more to give away, right? I'm just getting hungry and hungry and hungrier, right? So when Jesus gets to the crowd and they're already there, he's not getting frustrated that his introvert time is over. He's ready to feed them because he is hungry. And it's this amazing paradox in the kingdom. The last will be first. The door's in the floor. When you're hungry, then you've got something to feed people with. I know this as a pastor, man. If I'm not hungry, I can't feed people. Right? When you're hungry, you've got something to feed people with. Does that make, does that make sense? Let me keep reading through the scripture because it actually just gets better. All right, let me, um, <laughs> let me read from verse 15. This is amazing. Now, when it was evening, real quick thing. The Jewish rabbis say this about the Torah. They say every scripture is like a jewel. When you hold it up to the light, you see something different. Keep reading the same stories over and over and over, and you'll find, oh, it's on, all right, check this out. <laughs> verse 15. Now, when it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, this is a desolate place. And the day is now over. Send the crowds away. Jesus, this is a desolate place. Send the crowds away because they won't be fed. But Jesus had already redefined the place that was desolate as the place he was going to have a feast. So he was already expecting to feed people. If there's places in your life where you're convinced you can't meet God there, you'll never be able to lead someone in that place. There is not one part of the human experience that God hasn't entered Emmanuel, God with us. There is no state of brokenness where God can't meet you and God can't feed you. The disciples said, this is a desolate place, send them away. Jesus said, this is a desolate place, make them stay. Because I have redefined it as where I will eat so I can feed others. Right? So when, you, when you're feeling broken, which we all do, Jesus said, in this world you will have troubles. When you're feeling broken, you're, you're in grief, wh whatever the context is, I'm encouraging you, there is a feast to be had. And it will increase your hunger. And as leaders and as pastors and as shepherds and as people of God, because we're all leaders in one context or another, right? Leaders of ourselves, if no, if no one else. Until you meet God in that place, you will never be able to lead someone else in that place. And I don't want to be someone who can only lead someone when there's prosperity and there's, there's everything going well, right? Leaders come alive on the front line of battle. And that's why Jesus was able to minister the way he did, because he met God. He didn't say, all right, John the Baptist is dead. Let's go to the vineyard. He said, let's go to the place where there is nothing but me and him. It's so profound. So then they say, take him away. We, we can't feed him. Jesus says, keep him here. And then they say, but we only have these loaves and fishes. Because when, you've, when, when you believe that there's places in your life that God can't meet you, you won't have a mindset or a heart state of expectation. You'll say, I've only got this. I've only got this. I've only got this. Jesus said, that's all I need. Because I came here to feast. So bring it to me. And what does he do? He takes it. And he looks up to heaven. Because where you look defines what you see. If he had looked at the bread, all he would have seen is a picnic. He looked up to heaven, 
and he saw it as a feast. How often are we stewarding what's in our hand in the perspective of what heaven says that it is? I've only got this, I've only got this, I've only got this. Put it in the light of heaven. Let heaven redefine what you have in your hands. I'm going to get really honest for a moment because I, I read this to a couple in Bath whose marriage was suffering. And I said, you need to hold your marriage under the spotlight of heaven because all you see is arguments and disconnect. All you see is unfaithfulness. But if you put it under the spotlight of heaven, right, those broken lows and stinky fish will be redefined as a feast. This is making sense. And then he says a blessing. Because Jesus received everything as a gift. The apostle James, he writes it like this. He says, every good and perfect gift comes from the Father of lights in whom there are no shifting shadows. Everything is a gift. My friends, it's a gift. It's a gift. It's a gift. It's a gift. Everything is a gift. Everything is a gift. When you live like everything is a gift, you live with gratitude. The opposite of gratitude, the antithesis of gratitude is entitlement. Entitlement says, I deserve this, and so it's not enough. There's a difference between, between being entitled and having an inheritance, right? When you're aware of your inheritance, you're aware, actually, I will receive what's coming to me, and it is mine, but only because of someone else's service. If it's entitlement, it says, I deserve it, regardless of what someone else had done, right? It's mine. So the prodigal son, the younger son says, give it to me. I'm entitled to it, right? The older son thinks he's entitled to it as well. He goes, despite, can I riff on this really quick? He says, despite the, oh, let me, he, says to him, he says to the father, he says, all these years I've worked in your house, but you've never even given me a goat, right? Because he felt entitled. You've never even given me a goat to celebrate with my friends. And this son is getting a fattened calf. And then the father says, but everything I have is yours. So despite the gold he had been given, all he saw was the goat that he lacked. He had been given gold in the beginning because it says in John Luke 15, so the father divided his property. So he already had his inheritance, but he never accessed it because of his entitlement. He already had the gold, but he never saw it. All he saw was the lack of a goat. As sons and daughters of God, if we're walking around with entitlement, we're just going to miss out on everything that is our inheritance. So part of the reasons we're not receiving what God's given us isn't because it's not available, but because we're looking elsewhere for it. Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is God, and he still receives it as a blessing. Whew. Come on. All right. He looked up to heaven and said a blessing. Then he broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples. And the disciples gave them to the crowds. I want to stay on gratitude for a second longer. Gratitude is the opposite of entitlement, right? Gratitude always finds an expression. So if you want to live a, more, a lifestyle full more of gratitude, find the expression of gratitude in your life. In Luke 19, it says Jesus was walking into the city and his disciples were all dancing and singing and rejoicing because they'd seen him cast out demons, raise the dead and heal the lepers, right? And the Pharisees come up and they say, hey, Jesus, make your disciples sh be sh shut up, right? They, they, they look ridiculous. Rebuke them. Jesus says, if I tell them to be silent, the stones will cry out. Which means if we don't express our gratitude, the ground we stand on will fulfill our purpose, Right? You will have less purpose than an inanimate object if you don't express gratitude. Why? Because the whole order of creation is set towards gratitude. Because God, when he made the creation, said, it is good. I've already said it. It's good. This is a good thing. So everything is good. Everything has a reason to be grateful. That's good. That tree's good. That water's good. That's all, um, this is all good. I'm really grateful. This is all a gift, right? Gratitude always finds an expression. If you want to live more grateful, be more grateful. Start saying that you're grateful. When you, receive a, uh, when you receive a cup of coffee, thank you so much. Thank you. Because I'm drinking something right now that half the world's population will never have access to. Oh, it's a good cup of coffee. Thank you. This will change your life. Jesus, the Son of God, looked to heaven and said a blessing. Thank you, Father. Every act of gratitude is at its heart an act of war. Because it opposes, the, it opposes the schemes of the enemy to rob the world of hope and rob the world of the awareness that there is a resurrection taking place. 
All right? And then the third, third thing about gratitude. So gratitude is the opposite of entitlement. Gratitude will always find an expression. And gratitude is, gratitude is a gift for transformation. So in the feeding of the 5,000, it's when he says, and I don't, how did this look? We don't know. But when he said a blessing, it multiplied. It was transformed under the state of gratitude. So I wanna, I'm going to pray this over you right now. Father, I thank you that where there has been lack in this body, in, these, in families, in marriages, in people's heart, whatever lack looks like, financially, in purpose, in relationship, Lord, I thank you that as this family walks out in a state of gratitude, there will be transformation. Lord, I thank you that broken places will be transformed into states of abundance. Lord, I thank you that you're doing a new thing in the desolate places and that the desolate places will become the most fruitful places. Thank you, Lord. Amen. All right, final part of this scripture, and it gets even better. All right, he says, he broke the loaves, gave them to the disciples. The disciples gave them to the crowds, and they all ate, and they were satisfied. How about this? If we don't begin by declaring God as our source, we'll never be satisfied. So if Jesus hadn't begun by going to the desert place, redefining it as the place for a feast, he would have never had the, the, the heart place to declare what was a picnic as a feast. Then people would not have eaten the feast and would not have been satisfied. So the fact people were satisfied was defined by the fact that Jesus saw the desolate place as enough to meet with God. If we don't redefine the desolate places in our lives as the perfect opportunity to encounter God, we will not be satisfied and no one, no one else will be satisfied that comes into contact with us, right? So he, um, and the gate, they all ate and were satisfied, took up 12 baskets. That's a miracle in itself that everyone had a meal and was satisfied. Because in my family, the potatoes aren't cooked enough. Mama, I like my steak medium rare. You know, it's like, that's a miracle in itself. 5,000, 10,000 people were satisfied after eating a meal. Um, and those who ate were 5,000 besides men and women. Immediately after he satisfied everyone with the feast, he made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. There is 15,000 people, and Jesus dismisses his disciples to dismiss the crowd of 15,000 people by himself. That's another miracle. Why did he do it that way? Okay, how about this? The disciples only saw lack in this moment. So he wanted them out of the picture as soon as he could. Because <laughs> he wanted to end well, not with any grumbling. How about this? They would, with, their, with their mindset of lack, they would have only kept pressing into what wasn't there. And I think he just wanted to get rid of them. And I think it's a really important principle. right? If you're only seeing lack and you're around someone who's trying to get a breakthrough, you might get sidelined, <laughs> right? You're expensive to be around. And I've learned that a hard way for myself. Like, Josh, get secure, man. Like, you're bringing this whole situation down. It's not enough just to see blind spots. You've got to see what God is doing in desolate places, right? So he sends them away. He dismisses the crowd, which is just unbelievable. He has 15,000 people, could have planted a mega church, didn't do it, a meal was enough, right? And that's, that, that's such a powerful biblical principle, right? I, I remember hearing someone say this. He said, he said, daily bread for yourself is a material matter. Daily bread for someone else is a spiritual matter. When you feed yourself, you're taking care of your body. You provide a meal for someone else, that's spiritual warfare, it's powerful. The, the, the Gospels are full of meals because eating bread over a table is warfare. It's really powerful. Disciples go away. He dismisses the crowd, and he goes up to the mountain by himself to pray. I want to read what I wrote down here because I want to read exactly as I put it in my journal uh, for myself. Let me get this point right here. I wrote this. Josh, you live in the era of the crowd, yet you're lonely when you're not able to find peace in your aloneness. Jesus left the crowd so that he would never be alone. Jesus left the crowd of 15,000 people so that he wouldn't be alone because there's nothing lonelier than requiring something of a crowd or of a person that you could only get from God. You ever been in a room full of people and you feel all alone because you realize you're prostituting these people for something they'll never be able to give you? Jesus left the crowd so he would never be alone. That is something we need to know. That's something Joshua Luke Smith needs to learn. And, and there's an answer to that problem. It's called the spiritual discipline of solitude. And it's been practiced right since the beginning of our faith, all the way through. Solitude defines what we do with our aloneness. There's an amazing um, writer called Henry Nouwen. Anybody read Henry Nouwen? 
He's amazing. He's a, a, a theologian, philosopher, humanitarian. He's passed away, but he said this, the other side of human uniqueness, because we're all unique, amen? Yeah. We're all absolutely unique. The other side to our uniqueness is our aloneness because no one will ever be who you are and no one will ever go through what you go through as you go through it. So there is an aloneness to being unique. And he said this, what we do with our aloneness either leads to loneliness or solitude. Loneliness is a place of panic. Solitude is a place of peace. So we all experience aloneness because we're unique. What we do with our aloneness defines whether we live in anxiety or we live in peace. You have to be alone with yourself. I'm gonna end with this story. There were, uh, the psychologist, and, um, like, uh, Carl Jung, who had some brilliant things to say and some very messed up things to say as well. Uh, he tells a story though. He tells a story of a man who came to him for counsel because he was anxious. The man said to him, he says, I feel so depressed. I feel, this is a true story, I feel so anxious. I feel so pained in my heart all of the time. What can I do? And he said to him, well, what does your day look like? He says, I get up in the morning, I go to work, I come home, I do this, I do that. He says, okay, for the next 14 days, go to work, then come home, and for the rest of the day, be on your own. Come back to me in two weeks. Comes back to me in two weeks, and he says, I'm still feeling anxious. I'm still feeling irritated. I'm still feeling depressed. So um, Carl Young says, well, tell me about your day. He says, I got back from work, just like you said, all on my own. I read some Ernest Hemingway, listened to some Chopin, went to bed. Carl Young said, I asked you to be alone. Not to hang out with Hemingway, wow. not to hang out with Chopin, but to be on your own. The man said to him, why would I want to be on my own? I can't stand that person. And then, and then Carl Young said, and yet that's the person you inflict on everyone else throughout the day and even inflict upon yourself. Until we be feel, feel comfortable with our aloneness in the desolate places of our lives, we will never truly be satisfied in God. I believe in this family and in this house, God is doing a new thing. But I believe intrinsically it requires a greater level of desire and hunger for intimacy with God. This is my encouragement for this week. You do something called Take 15, right? Is that a daily practice? I dare you. In your take 15s this week, you can take one scripture if you want it, but nothing more than one verse. This is, a, this is an old ancient discipline. This isn't a, this isn't a, a get, out of, get out clause reading the Bible. Take one verse, turn off your phone, leave your phone in the other room and sit in silence and be aware of what comes up. And you might feel an anxiety and you might feel a fear. It gives an opportunity for the Holy Spirit to cast it out. Perfect love casts out fear. Perfect love does not ask fear to leave politely. And so this is how I open the conference. And I'm going to close my message with it. Your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. That's where God lives. It might be time to find out who's squatting in the temple and get them evicted. All right? Can we stand up? I'm just going to pray over you guys. Why don't you just put out your hands just to receive? Father, as we stand here with our hands out, Lord, we are aware that what fills our palms feels like nothing but meager loaves of bread and stinky fish. Lord, we are aware with what we have, and we ask you this morning to transform what we have in the light of your presence, with gratitude in our heart, with compassion for ourselves before anything else, Lord. We ask that we would be transformed. Lord, I declare of every single person in this room I speak to your heart. I want you to hear this individually. My friend, God is doing a new thing. Do you not perceive it? Like a way in the wilderness, like streams in the desert. It's not going to be like it was before. It's not going to be where it was before. It's going to be right for this time and place. And I bless it in Jesus' name. Amen.